Hello, and welcome to the Pediatric Foundational Series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. My name is Allison Lawrence, and I'm a pediatric dietitian in Southern California, and I'm also a certified nutrition support clinician. And I am your host for our foundational series here on the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. So our goals for these videos are to really provide you with the fundamental pediatric nutrition assessment tools that we will then be able to take and utilize in order to build robust pediatric nutrition support prescriptions. In today's video, we're going to be talking all about growth charts as well as malnutrition. As a pediatric dietitian, growth charts are extremely important to understand as they are used as a part of our nutritional assessment. So we not only have our anthropometric measurements, but we take them a step further and plot them on growth charts. So it's important to understand how to interpret percentiles as well as these scores, which we'll talk about today. There are many different growth charts that have been created. There are those that are available for preterm infant patient populations. There are those that are developed for term infants and children up until two years of age. There are growth charts available for children between the ages of two through 20 years of age, and also some specialty condition growth charts. First, when we're talking about growth charts, it's important to be able to understand our general terminology. So when you hear growth charts talked about, you'll often hear percentiles utilized. And a percentile is gonna tell us how much of the reference patient population is above or below a child on a growth chart. So if you've ever seen a growth chart, you'll note that there are many different lines on that growth chart, and each of those lines is going to represent a percentile. So you might see 50th percentile, 25th percentile, and what that's telling you is how much of the reference patient population is above or below that child on that growth chart. So for example, if I had a patient that was plotting at the 50th percentile, that means that 50% of the reference patient population is above that child on that growth chart, and 50% is going to be below. So our percentiles are always gonna be positive measurements. So they're great for being able to tell us our general trends, but aren't necessarily so great when we get into severities of different percentiles. So for example, below the third percentile or above the 97th percentile, we're no longer able to be able to quantify that. And so if I had a patient that was plotting below the third percentile, and let's say I had two underweight patients, one might be very below the third percentile, and one might be very, very below the third percentile, but using very and very, very are not good descriptive terms. So we know in clinical practice, we always like to be objective and have those specific values that we can actually quantify. That is going to be where our Z-scores come into play. So Z-scores are a little bit newer to pediatrics, but what they are is it's defined as a standard deviation away from the mean, that mean being the average at the 50th percentile. And so our Z-scores are great for us to be able to quantify those severities of the abnormalities of the values and also see improvements within our overall weight trends. So going back to my example of those two underweight children, the one that's plotting at very below the third percentile might have a Z-score of negative two, whereas the one that's very, very below might have a z-score of negative five. So you can see that those two values are very different from one another and have different severities of malnutrition. So z-scores are also gonna be utilized in order to diagnose and document malnutrition, which we'll talk about a little bit later. First, we'll begin with discussing our preterm growth charts. So it's important to plot preterm infants on preterm growth charts because we are really comparing them to how they should be growing compared to intrauterine growth. So the Fenton growth chart is one of the ones that's commonly utilized, and the most recent revision to the Fenton was in 2013, and this revision allowed for ease of transition onto the World Health Organization chart once it's time for that preterm infant to transition onto a term infant growth chart. And there are charts that are available for weight, length, and hot circumference, and the Fenton is utilized for infants between 22 to 50 weeks gestational age. There's also the Olsen growth chart. So the Olsen growth chart is designed for use for infants between 22 to 40 weeks gestational age, and it includes data from racially diverse children. So the recent revision to the Fenton in 2013 did also include data from the Olsen growth charts. Our next growth charts that we'll talk about are term infants and children between zero to two years of age. So these children should be plotted on the WHO growth charts or the World Health Organization growth charts, and charts are available for weight, they're available for length, and remember that length should be taken in a lying down recumbent position, usually with a length board. We have our head circumference, which should be taken up until two years of age, and we also have our weight for length, which tells us the proportionality of the child. 
And so these World Health Organization growth charts were created based off of six different countries' data looking at breastfed infants. And just a special note for preterm infants that are plotted on these growth charts, it's important to remember that we need to correct for gestational age. So we will correct for gestational age up until two years of age because it's not fair for me to compare a healthy term three-month-old infant to a preterm infant that has a chronological age of three months but was three months early, so therefore when they're corrected, they're only zero months. So it's important that we continue to correct up until two years of age. The next growth charts that we'll talk about are for children between the ages of two through 20 years of age. So these children should be plotted on the CDC growth charts and charts have been available for weight, available for our height, as well as available for BMI. So yes, in pediatrics, we do calculate our BMI, but we take it a step further and plot them on our growth charts. And the different percentiles are gonna be our different weight classifications. So we have patients that fall under the fifth percentile are considered to be underweight. Patients between the fifth through the 84th percentile are considered to be normal. 84th to 95th percentile is considered to be overweight, and above the 95th percentile is considered to be obese. There are also condition-specific growth charts that have been created for cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, Marfan syndrome, as well as other conditions. And it's important to know that there are some limitations to utilizing these growth charts, including some small sample sizes. So I always recommend kind of cross comparing the trends of your patient and ensuring that your patient is achieving what they're expected weight gain and growth potential is. We also utilize mid upper arm circumferences in pediatrics. So this is a measure of the muscle, the fat and the bone, and it's an independent marker for mortality and is tightly correlated with BMI. So these measurements can then be taken and they have subsequent Z scores that are related to the measurements. And they are also utilized to be able to diagnose malnutrition. Most electronic medical records will have the growth charts built into them. Usually you'll have growth charts if you have pediatric patients. But if you're ever looking to analyze the trends of your patient that might not be in the medical record, or if you don't have access to the medical record, a really great tool is PD Tools. So PD Tools is a web-based application that is available on your internet browser, but is also available as an app where you can enter in your patient specific data. So their weight, their height, their age, their birth date, even you can enter preterm infant data on here and it'll calculate the percentiles as well as the z-scores for these patients. So now that we've talked all about anthropometric measurements, let's discuss how we can utilize them to diagnose malnutrition. So pediatric malnutrition is formally defined as when there's an imbalance between nutritional intake, nutrient utilization, or nutrient absorption that results in a deficit of either macro or micronutrient needs that negatively impacts overall growth and development. And so malnutrition criteria has been developed for neonatal patients between zero through 30 days of life, pediatric patients between one month through 18 years of age. And yes, even though you might be within a pediatric hospital, oftentimes we do still have children that are greater than 18 years of age come into the hospital. So you will also utilize whatever your facility has decided to use for adult malnutrition criteria, whether that's the Aspen and the AND criteria or the GLIM criteria. So neonatal malnutrition is relatively new. It was released in 2018 from Aspen in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics after a gap had been identified for patients who did not fall under the intended use for the pediatric malnutrition criteria. So this was a literature review and an expert consensus from eight highly experienced neonatal dietitians. And they basically created criteria that can be divided into three different categories. So we have criteria that is utilized for the first two weeks of life, and this is based off of energy intakes. We then have criteria that are used following those two weeks of life, and those can be divided into primary indicators that require one indicator. So this can be a weight for age z-score deceleration or percentage of expected weight gain velocity. And then we have our primary indicators that require two or more indicators, which include our percentage of linear growth velocity, as well as a length for age z-score deceleration and days to regain birth weight. Pediatric malnutrition criteria was created in 2014 from Aspen and AND after they published a joint consensus statement with the criteria for identifying and diagnosing malnutrition in the pediatric patient. Similarly to the neonatal malnutrition criteria, this is divided into two different categories. We have our primary indicators that require one indicator. So these are Z-score based and they include mid-upper arm circumference Z-scores, BMI for age Z-scores, 
weight for length z-scores as well as length for age z-scores. And then we have primary indicators that require two or more indicators that can then be expanded out to include other different categories. So we have our percentage of expected weight gain velocity if the child is less than two years of age. We have weight loss for children that are greater than two years of age, inadequate nutrient intake, as well as a deceleration within the weight for length z-score. So when it comes to documenting pediatric malnutrition, PES statements generally require the clinician diagnosing malnutrition to use a couple of different defining factors. So we first need to be able to determine whether that malnutrition is acute or chronic. So acute is generally less than three months, whereas chronic is generally greater than three months. Also must choose the etiology. So is it acute illness related? Is it chronic illness related? Is it social and behavioral factoral related? And then we must also determine the severity. So is it mild malnutrition? Is it moderate or is it severe? Now we'll be able to take this information and use it and apply it within a case study. Patient XY is a 15 year old female who was diagnosed with osteosarcoma four months ago. Since starting treatment, XY has lost 13 pounds. The weight loss is related to lack of nutrient intake. Mom reports the patient has been eating less than 25% of usual meals due to side effects, including nausea and vomiting that are associated with her chemotherapy medications. So we are challenged with the task of writing a PES statement for diagnosing malnutrition. In order to do that, we must analyze her anthropometric trends. So the patient weighed 120 pounds before a diagnosis, which is 54.4 kilos, with a BMI Z-score of 0.46. Her current weight is 107 pounds, which is 48.5 kilos, with a Z-score of negative 0.27. The weight loss equals 5.9 kilos, which is 11% of the patient's usual body weight, and her BMI Z-score decline is 0.73. So based off of these data points, XY would meet criteria for severe protein calorie malnutrition. I chose this example because you might be thinking, hey, her Z-score right now does not meet criteria for malnutrition. It's not between negative 1 to negative 1.9 or negative 2 to negative 2.9, and you would be right. But we have other factors that are going to lead to us being able to diagnose her with severe malnutrition. So her weight loss of 11% of her usual body weight falls into the severe category. And her energy intake of less than 25% also puts her within the severe category as well. So I have two indicators and I can then diagnose her with malnutrition. If I were writing a PES statement for XY, I would diagnose her with chronic protein calorie malnutrition related to chronic illness of cancer as evidenced by weight loss of 11% of usual body weight and inadequate nutrient intake of less than 25% of what she normally eats. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Please feel free to stay tuned for future videos on this channel where we talk about all things pediatrics. And if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. Mm -hmm.